Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So last class we had uh, started talking about uh, absorption spectroscopy, right? And we, end, uh, where uh, I think we ended the class uh, by showing you this, uh, you know, that cell where you have this wall and all those things, right? So let's uh, look at that again. So this was the absorption spectrum of amino acids. That's uh, what we were talking about. So on the y-axis you have the extinction coefficient that's plotted against the wavelength, right? Okay, so this is what we were talking about, and uh, what we said was that, you know, based on your absorbance, which is this one, a lambda absorbance, this is equal to log of i zero by i, which is equal to epsilon times c times l, right? Now, but this i zero and i, they're a little bit different in the sense that i zero is the intensity of light, which is striking the sample solution, right? not the qubit. I is the intensity which is coming out of the or which is being transmitted by the sample solution. right? So that means before it leaves the qubit. So what I mean is, as I was saying, so if this is a zoomed in portion of your qubit, so if this is your sample qubit and you have zoomed into a portion of the sample qubit. right? So here you see this is your thickness, this is your qubit wall thickness. Okay. Now, when we talk about the path length, that path length essentially should not be including, should not be including the qubit wall, right? Why? Because that qubit wall, wall does not give rise to anything; it's nothing there. So, the path length should essentially be that path length throughout which you have the solution. That's why you see the L varies from where, or the L ranges from where? The L ranges from, or the L is within the inner walls of the qubit. Okay. That's essentially what the L is, right? But then, when you stick your cuvette in an absorption spectrometer, okay, when you stick it there, you have to have the walls, right? And because of this, the incident light, which is this one, this is the incident light, where is this light coming from? This light is coming from the lamps we discussed yesterday. This incident light I i is the one which is striking the outer wall, but by the time it reaches the sample solution at the inner wall, it is not necessary that I i is to be equal to I 0. There can be some scattering, there can be some other extraneous absorptions and all these things and hence typically what always happens is I 0 is less than I of I, the incident light. So the same thing happens on the other side, the I s which is the one which leaves the sample or leaves the cuvet is not the same as I which is the one which is coming out of the sample, right. So how do you take these things into consideration, I mean how do you make uh, adjustments for this or how do you correct for this. So what people have devised is, people have devised something known as a double beam spectrophotometer, okay, double beam. So in double beam what it refers to is means two beams, right, essentially double beam, okay. So what they do is, you can see you have the source, this is the source, you know the lamps you have, then you have a monochromator because I showed you that the lamps have these series of wavelengths, right, so the series of wavelengths and the monochromator what it does is it selects the wavelengths for you, it disposes it and then it selects the wavelengths for you, right. And then after the light is coming out of that, yeah. after dispersion, then you have a beam splitter. You see, this is this is known as a beam splitter. So beam splitter means what it sounds. Beam splitter means it splits the beam. That's it. So you have a so you have a mirror like this. Okay, so you essentially have a mirror like this, right? Which would pass one half like this, and the other half comes to the other side. Okay, so that's why you will see it's a combination of two. There is one which goes in this direction, the other one which comes in this direction. So one gets reflected to the left, the other one gets reflected to the right. Okay? So now you started with one beam, 
coming out of the monochrome array, it was split into two. So that's why it's called a double beam spectral photometer. Okay. Now what is the use of this? Now think about this. So suppose in this one, say so in this one where I S S stands for your sample. Okay. And here, when you are talking about this one, is I R where R is your reference. Now what do you mean by that? That means that suppose you have taken a compound in a certain solvent which is a sample, the reference is typically the one which does not have the compound. That means it is only the solvent for you, right. So what do you do is, you can see here on this side, so, so look at the solution side, okay. So look at this, so look at this uh, side. What you have is you have I I and then you have I S because you cannot measure I 0 and I, you cannot measure that. You can only measure the, you, you only know the one which is incident and the one which is coming out, right. So then what you do is, this one goes to a detector and then you plot A or you calculate A based on log of I I by I S, okay. So incident by what the sample sends through. Now you do the same thing, what you do is now, see you do not know what the incident light is, right. You do not know what the incident light is because you do not know what incident light is being or is hitting the sample because again of the simple reason that you have this wall. So now what you do is the other half, the other half goes to the sol, uh, goes to the reference which is the solvent only, no sample. There you get log of I i over I r, right. So the first one was I incident over I sample. The next one was, the next one is I incident over I reference, no sample. Now what would happen is, what would you do? If you, if you do A s minus A r, what would happen? What are you taking care of? Look at that. Do you have I i anymore? You do not have I, it is already cancelled, right. So this is what you call, you measure the absolute absorption spectrum. That means by doing this, by doing this dual beam, what you have done is, you have taken I i in both the cases, you have done a subtraction and that has cancelled out. So what you are left with is the absolute or true absorption spectrum, which is referred to as I r over I of s, okay. So I r obviously would be higher because you do not, you do not have the sample. So it is going to have high intensity and I s where you have the sample, the intensity would be lower and you get the true absorbance, okay. Now how is the experiment typically done? Please also remember this, this is not the only thing. The thing is, if you, if you are having two beams, that means you are using two qubits. So this is qubit 1, this is this is qubit 2, right. Now no matter how much carefully you manufacture the qubits, obviously you do not manufacture, but the company manufactures it for you there would always be subtle differences in the cuvettes, always be subtle differences. So what people would do then is, the first thing they would do is they would do a baseline. Baseline means in both the cases, that means in both the cuvettes, without putting sample, what would they put? They would put IR, that means R, reference. So what would this take care of? This would take care of what? Whatever difference you have in terms of the cuvette path and cuvette dimensions and all those things. The next one, so this is your baseline correction. So the next one, what you do is now you put in, you take the I R in one of the qubits, I mean one of the sample holders out and put in I S like you have done it. And then that is why when you will do your absorption spectroscopy, you would see there is something known as a baseline correction. This is exactly what you are doing. And the reason being that no matter how much you try, all qubits essentially are not the same. There are bound to be some differences, okay. The differences might be small, might be big depending upon how carefully the manufacturer manufactured it, okay. So this is the principle behind a double beam spectrophotometer, right. Now you know, you think about this, if you would do it with a single beam, you would not be having this luxury, okay. That is why double beams are so very frequently used nowadays. So this is uh, just a block diagram of your absorption spectrophotometer. So what happens is, you can see the two lamps, this is the tungsten lamp, the tungsten lamp and this is the deuterium lamp, these are the two lamps out here. So these by these uh, two square uh, things, right. After that, you just let us not go into the specifics, just, just try to understand the scheme, the general scheme. Once the light comes out, the light has to be directed towards the sample. So what does that, uh, what is it, uh, it done by? It is done by a mirror called a toroidal mirror, okay. Do not worry about what a toroid is, the mirror is so chosen that you have the maximum amount of reflectance or the maximum amount of light which is guided towards the sample cell, that is what you pick out. Now after that what happens is, you have an inference slit, a slit which allows it to go through, you have a mirror, 
out here, then you have a grading. So this is a part of your monochromator. This is a part of your monochromator. Remember the monochromator we had in the previous slide? So this is a part of the monochromator. So the monochromator might be having one grading or two gradings, depending upon that, it would be a single grading or double grading. So this grading, what, what it would do is, whatever light it's coming in, it would help disperse it. Okay, once it is dispersed, now you can see what happens is, again the light comes back, this, the parabolic mirror, this mirror, which reflected the light onto the gradient, again collects it. Once it collects it, it comes through the exit slit, like this. So one was the entrance through which it went towards the parabolic mirror, went to the grading, came back to the parabolic mirror, the parabolic mirror refocused it, it came through the exit slit. Now once you have the exit slit, now look at this, your sample is here, right? This is your, this is your sample area. Again, you have to guide the beam or the light towards the sample area. So what you ha have is after this exit slit, you have another mirror. So this is a direction. So it comes here, there's a toroid mirror. Uh, you have a whole of other optics, but finally see what happens. You have a reference beam and you have a sample beam. So two beams are coming out, okay? And then again, you have uh, out here and then you have a detector, okay? So either you have one, either you have two detectors, Two detectors means one for the reference and one for the sample. That means you have two beams or you can have one detector and then do something so that you can get the proper observance, right? So this is typically how the inside, how the inside of an absorption spectrophotometer looks, a double beam one, right? You know, depending upon who manufactures it, components would differ, the type of mirrors would just differ, the way you you know, design the monochromators would differ, differ, but the principle still remains the same. You're going to have this thing in general, okay? So that's, uh, you know, uh, typically all what I had to uh, tell you about um, absorbance. Just one thing uh, I need to point out, which I forgot uh, last time before I go on to fluorescence, is uh, this. So there is something known as oscillator strength. So there is something known as oscillator strength. Now where does this, uh, you know, name oscillator come from? So think about this. See what was the intrinsic meaning behind an extinction coefficient? The intrinsic meaning, meaning behind an extinction coefficient is, what is the probability of that molecule absorbing light at that wavelength? Okay, that was the meaning of the extinction coefficient. It is so intrinsic to the molecule. It is a fundamental property of the molecule, okay? Now, how does it happen? When your electromagnetic light comes in, that is your energy density comes in, it is varying as a function of time, either cosine or sine. Now, what it does is, when it hits your sample, it also sets the sample in motion. Now, it does not set the sample in motion. What does it set, uh, motion, uh, what does it, uh, set motion into? It sets the electrons into motion, right? Because that's the ones which are easily moved around. Now the electrons would also respond to this oscillating nature of light. So what would happen is these electrons would oscillate. Because the electrons would oscillate, there would be change in charge distribution, all these things. So remember, this would bring about a change in your transition, in a change in a moment, giving rise to transition. So we talked about the transition moment. So the bottom line is that whenever your light comes in, it sends your electrons in motion. Now, depending upon the frequency, if the frequency is high, then the electrons would also oscillate very with a rapid frequency. If the frequency is low, then the electrons would be oscillating less frequently, okay? But, so what it means is, the mere extent of this oscillation of electrons will determine to what extent it absorbs at that wavelength. And hence, this oscillator strength should be related this oscillator strength should be related to your molar extinction coefficient in some way or the other. There should, there has to be a relation because both of these are speaking about the same thing. One is talking about the probability of the transition, the other one is talking about the oscillation of the electrons which finally lead to the transition. So those, you know, typically this should be related. So what happens is, so this is, uh, I'll just give you the relation. The oscillator strength, it is symbolized by this thing F, okay? So F, the oscillator strength is equal to, I'll just give you the value, just remember it. 4.32 times 10 to the power minus 9 over n. n is a refractive index, remember. This is a refractive index times this, times this, okay? So what it means is, so again, n is a refractive index of your solution. 
okay and what do you have in the integral what you have in the integral is here just look at this you have what is epsilon epsilon is extension coefficient epsilon is extension coefficient but what units are you expressing it in nu bar you are expressing it in nu bar that means centimeter inverse right times d nu bar so this essentially is your whole absorption spectrum if you keep in mind this essentially is the area under your whole absorption spectrum now this is how an oscillator strength is related to epsilon okay just by this equation just keep this in mind because both of these are talking about the same thing right the reason we choose nu bar well there are other reasons for it but it's essentially because nu bar is proportional to energy right and you are supplying it with some energy density and according to that your electrons are oscillating with that you know whatever frequency you are supplying okay now again this is based on the electromagnetic nature of light this is based on classical physics right what about when we are talking about quantum mechanics when we talked about quantum mechanics we did an integral what was that integral that integral was the transit the transition moment integral remember we talked about the transition moment so that was purely from quantum mechanics right we talked about wave functions and all these things we talked about overlap the frank on overlap and all these things so see if this oscillator strength is related to extension coefficient which talks about probability of transition your transition moment also talks about your probability of transition then again both of these things should be related right because again both of these are talking about the same thing right why should they not be related only one thing is the one is classical the other one is quantum that's it that's the only difference so again so there is a relation for us so if <coughs> just for the sake of knowing it f is related to i'll give you m h nu over pi e squared times b 1 2 let this be 2 where m where m is the mass of the electron m is the mass of the electron nu is the corresponding frequency and e you know is electronic charge right do you remember what b12 is where did we encounter b12 einstein's coefficient right einstein's coefficient of absorption this is the einstein coefficient of absorption b12 okay so this is what it should be related to because you're talking about absorption uh, transition now b12 b12 is related by k k times m squared where k is a constant do not worry what the constant is what is m the m was a transition moment we talked about so b is proportional to the square of the transition moment integral of the transition moment f has a relation with b b is proportional to m squared that means f is also proportional to what m squared so this is the relation between the oscillator strength and the transition moment okay so it again it just says is that the probability of the electrons oscillating the probability of the electrons oscillating determines the transition and because it is a transition i better have a relation between this oscillator strength and the transition moment integral that's what we looked at just now okay do not worry about what the constants are and all these things we have we do not have time to uh, go into the, uh, those details uh, in this uh, course at least but this is the general expression or the general feeling you should be having about these two things one is the oscillator strength and the other, uh, other one is the transition moment both of these talk about the same thing okay good so that was the last uh, bit of information i want to tell you about uh, absorption so now if you have excited the molecule that means the molecule is i mean the molecule has excited uh, has absorbed light the electrons have gone to the excited state but it cannot stay there forever right they have to come down that means they have to get deactivated or de-excited so you you go there it stays there for some time depending upon a host of other factors which we will talk about and then after some time it will come down to the ground state again that means it will relax or it will de-excite from the excited state okay so what are the processes involved obviously one of the processes involved is fluorescence right so but let's look at a very important diagram i'm sure you have heard about this this is called a jablonski diagram okay now look it has too many levels energy levels but don't be intimidated by that all of these things you have seen before first look at it step by step what is s0 s0 is a singlet ground state for you okay what is s1 s1 is the excited singlet state for you right what is t1 
T1 is a triplet state. Good. Now, you look at all these levels, you look at all these levels associated with S1. What are these levels? These are your vibration levels. Remember, when we were drawing the uh, diagram, we had those vibration levels, right? So similarly, any electronic state like S0, S1, T1, T1 would be having its corresponding vibration levels. So whether you look at S0, whether you look at S1, whether you look at T1, you would be having those levels anyway out there. Okay. So that's why what you have is in S1, you also have these levels. In uh, T1, you have these levels, right? In T2, you have these levels. Okay. Now what are S2 and T2? So if S1 is the first singlet excited state, S2 is what? The second excited state. T2 is what? The second excited triplet state right okay now you have done an absorption so right so this is this is the absorption this is the absorption right so absorption takes place very fast very fast what is the fastest time scale or what is the approximate time scale it takes place in the absorption takes place in about 10 to the power minus 10 to the minus 15 seconds okay so 10 to the minus 15 seconds that's what you're looking at absorption 10 to the minus 15 seconds okay good so now remember, when we have made this transition, the nuclei have not responded. Only after making this transition do the nuclei start responding to this change process. Good. Now suppose, suppose it is, uh, so let's say, suppose let's look at these, these bunch of arrows. So you, you have gone to S1. Now you can see, as we discussed last time, you, you are not going to have only one transition, right? Because you're, if you're, you're having this transition from where V is equal to zero state, of S0, because the electron density goes like this, you are going to have a band of transitions, right, throughout that wave function, right. So that is why you have these series of transitions to different, uh, uh, you know, vibration levels, this vibronic transitions, we have talked about this intensity before, but the deal is this, guys, the deal is that you, you look at this, say you look at this arrow, this arrow takes the molecule to the highest vibrational excited state in S0 based on this diagram, right, because this is a representative diagram, okay. Now let me tell you this, there are two things that can happen, either the molecule from here comes back straight to S0, comes back straight to S0 by some way or the other or instead the from here it slowly first decays to the first vibration state of S1 itself and then comes down. So let me tell you this again, consider the fact that you have gone to the highest vibration excited state of S1, right. So that means you are already in a higher vibration uh, energy in S1, there are two things that can happen, it can the molecule can uh, relax straight from here, this higher level to the ground state S0 or it can slowly lose its energy not slowly, it can lose its energy, go to V is equal to 0 of S1 and then come down. There are two ways of doing it, right, okay. Now this, this line, this wiggly line I just drew is referred to as VR which is referred to as vibrational relaxation, okay. You will see it in the next slide. This vibration relaxation, it is called vibration relaxation simple because the relaxation is hap happening between what states? Vibrational states. What is the time scale guys? The time scale of this relaxation is 10 to the minus, minus 10 to the minus 12 seconds. 10 to the minus 12 seconds is pretty fast, okay. It is faster, it is faster than the time the molecule will take to relax from this state to the ground state. So you can imagine what will happen is, which one will proceed now? Because VR is much faster than this process. So you will be having a vibration relaxation first and then it would come down to the ground state because its time scale is just faster than the time it needs to come down to the ground state straight away. So this is called a vibration relaxation. If you would ever you know look up these processes, you would see that there is another process known as IVR which is called intramolecular vibration relaxation and people who are especially doing gas phase spectroscopy are very interested in this, okay, but that is essentially looking at, right. But remember, in gas phase, I told you, you do not have too much of broadening as compared to condensed phase because condensed phase, you have too many solve molecules, too many interactions. Your gas phase, you do not have that. So that is why people can potentially look at those. But here, it is very limited, okay. Now, so one was vibration relaxation, right. So that means you, you were having relaxation in the same 
vibration levels or rather in the vibration levels of the same electronic state. I am not talking about relaxation in two different electronic states. Also second is vibration relaxation is a non radiative path length. that means when a relaxation is happening it is not giving out any photons. What is it doing? It is giving out energy, it is giving out this energy as the thermal energy. Where did we use this? Do you remember? Where did we use this relaxation before? Come on, one of you will have to tell me. Okay, good. Which part? That itself was huge. Which part? What was the last thing we discussed in kinetics? Okay, the second last thing. It was not the last thing. Before optical trigger. Temperature jump. We discussed temperature jump. What did we say in temperature jump? You heat the solvent. The solvent goes out to a vibration excited state. It relaxes. It loses the energy and that energy is picked up by what? The protein molecules. This is essentially what is happening. So that excess energy gets picked up by whatever molecules you have in the surroundings, right? So anyway, in this case, it gives out the excess energy and goes to V is equal to 0 of that electronic state S1, okay? Now, look at this process. This IC, what is the full form of IC? Internal conversion. Where does internal conversion occur? Between which two states? Between two electronic states, right? Either S1 is 0 or either S2, S1, okay? But look at this. If you look at the IC, the internal conversion, it is again a non radiative pathway. Again, a non radiative path. See, whatever wiggly lines you have, these all refer to non radiative pathways. Okay, that is the importance of the wiggly lines. Now, this internal conversion, if you look at this, please keep this in mind. This internal conversion, when you are having this conversion from S1 to S0, you are not, you are not having the conversion from S1 to V is equal to 0 level of S0. Where are you having the conversion to? You are having the conversion to a higher vibration level of S0 itself, is not it? See, how would the conversion happen? The conversion would only happen very easily if you would have isoenergetic energy levels. That means, if you have these two, if you have these two, the molecule, the electron can be here, the electron can be here, it does not matter because these are isoenergetic, there is no energetic bias. It is not, you know, it is like a Boltzmann population, right? This is obviously they are of a same energy, so they have equal probability of being here or here. Now, what will happen is you think about this. See, this is S1, the V is equal to 0 state of S1, right? So, this is the one. So, this is this is the V is equal to 0 state of S1, okay? And this is S1, this is overlapping with the higher vibration state of S0. The moment this one relaxes to S, the high vibration state S0, you know that this VR is very fast. So, the moment it happens, it will come down. That is what you see to the lowest vibration state V0. Now, this is how an internal conversion happens. So, it is always, remember, it is always between isoenergetic levels. Isoenergetic levels means levels having the same energy. It is just not jumping from one energy level to the other, okay? This picture you have to have in mind, okay? So, that means wherever IC happens, it would be like this. Similarly, you can also have IC from S2 to S1, right? Again, there you see the lowest vibration state of S2 is overlapping or is equi-energetic with a higher vibration state of S1. It goes there and then it again comes down to V is equal to 0 of S1, okay? So, that was your internal conversion. But please remember the internal conversion, and I come to this in the next slide where it is written out there. The internal conversion is essentially happening between two states having the same what? Same multiplicity. That is very important. It's internal conversion. That means internal conversion between two states having the same spin state, same multiplicity. Right. Okay. Now, what about the ISC? What is ISC? It is inter system crossing. As the name suggests, it is inter system. That means you are now moving from one system to the other. So, what are the two systems here? The one is say S1 to T1. Again, you see in this ISC, what is happening is it is again an isoenergetic transition, right? Or isoenergetic conversion. That means the V is equal to 0 level of S1 is overlapping or is equi energetic or isoenergetic with a higher vibrational state of T1. It goes there, then it comes down, okay? So, this is inter system crossing. Now, the question is, is inter system crossing allowed or not? 
just tell me is inter system crossing transition allowed or not why is this, why is it forbidden so there is a change in spin multiple so now if you are having a change obviously it is forbidden then why do you see it I mean you should not be seeing it right theoretically you should not be seeing it but it does happen mixing so there is mixing there is mixing between the triplet and the singlet state that means whatever triplet state you see or whatever singlet state you see that psi is equal to a coefficient and psi singlet plus a coefficient times psi triplet. So, hence what I can write out here is I can write that psi because of this inter system crossing says a plus b psi 3 that means a and b are the coefficients a is the coefficient of the wave function corresponding to the singlet state b is the coefficient of the wave function corresponding to the triplet state that means that wave function is a mix of two states singlet and triplet. Now to what extent this mixing happens would finally determine to what extent you have the inter system crossing but there is something which which increases the mixing there is a term there is a term which refers to this mixing or increases the mixing what is that the term ends it is two words the last word is coupling what is the first word okay just 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 go yeah just go beyond the first one is spin what is the other one yeah so it is a spin orbit coupling I told you everything almost right it is no longer a question I was giving the answer to my own question anyway so it is a spin orbit coupling it is a spin orbit coupling which determines this inter system crossing okay so you have to have spin orbit coupling right okay guys do not write I, I had this I will even give you a handout so do not worry about it just listen now because this is a fundamental picture of fluorescence this you always have to keep in mind if you are doing fluorescence right whatever intensity of fluorescence whatever emission of fluorescence you see is governed by these processes as simple as that now two things whatever we have talked about isc ic vr right these are all non radiative processes that means they do not come with emission of photons right so what are the two radiative processes that are left for us one is fluorescence the other one is phosphorescence so fluorescence obviously is from s1 to s0 almost always only there are a few cases where you can have fluorescence from s2 to s0 there are very few cases okay so one is fluorescence and then the other one which is from t1 to s0 right remember which is again spin forbidden but it gives out light it is referred to as phosphorescence okay so that means in the jablonski diagram you have a combination of two types of processes one process that gives out photons the other process that does not give out photons that means you do not see but how would you see it is like this suppose you are putting in 100 photons that means a molecule is absorbing 100 photons right if all the that means if you are pumping in 100 photons and if you have a detector it is an ideal case you also look at 100 photons that means each and every photon that it absorbed it gave out one fluorescence photon. So that means it is quantum yield it is something known as quantum yield is one. So for every absorbing photon it has one emitting photon right I am talking about fluorescence now let us not go to phosphorescence okay. However the moment you see that the number of uh, photons emitted is far less it cannot be greater than the number of photons absorbed it is far less than the number of photons absorbed what does it mean that means the other photons which you could not see must have gone through what the non radiative channels so that means you have a combination between the radiative processes and the non radiative processes and that finally determines to what extent you are going to see emission see the only thing you see is emission remember but by seeing the extent of emission you know how much of radiative non radiative process you have essentially how much of non radiative process you have that is why this parameter called quantum yield is of such a huge importance in fluorescence right that is essentially what it says the yield means it is like if you are doing a synthetic reaction you always talk about the yield right in this case you are also doing a reaction but a photochemical thing so it is essentially photophysical you are not doing any chemistry so that means you hit it with photons it goes to the higher state it comes down to the ground state 
right? And whatever number of photons it yields in terms of fluorescence will give you the quantum yield, okay? So this is typically how a Jablonski diagram or you know the, the features of a Jablonski diagram, right? Is there anything that I missed? Let me check out. I do not think so, but anyway, we will see soon. So as I said, what are the deactivation pathways? One is a radiative deexcitation, it involves fluorescence and phosphorescence. The other one is a non-radiative deexcitation, which involves vibration relaxation, internal conversion and inter-system crossing, okay? And I said that vibration relaxation is very fast, about 10 to the minus 12 seconds, right? Okay. So let us look at the characteristics times now, absorption about 10 to the minus 15 seconds, vibration relaxation you can see 10 to the minus 12 to the minus 13 seconds, fluorescence that is lifetime of the excited state can vary from 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the minus 7 seconds. So you can see now even before fluorescence happens that means it comes down your vibration relaxation is much faster. So remember I said that it always has to go to the V is equal to 0 state. Okay. <laughs> Similarly inter system crossing which is 10 to the minus 10 to the minus 6 seconds. Internal conversion, internal conversion is non-radiative. It is from one electronic state to the other electronic state of same multiplicity. It is still 10 to the minus 11 to 10 to the minus 9 seconds. So your vibration relaxation is still faster than what? Internal conversion, right? And then you have the lifetime of the excited state which is a triplet. The phosphorescence, it is typically much delayed, right? See fluorescence is from, is the order of nanoseconds. Phosphorus in the order of microseconds, which is minus is micro. ISC is much faster than ISC. ISC? Much faster than ISC. Why is it so? It says 10 to the minus 8 to 10 to the minus 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the minus 8, right? IC is 10 to the minus 11 to 10 to the minus 9. Hmm. Which is faster? IC. Where? You look at the range. Okay? Good. You have not crossed systems, right? Anyway, so yeah, where was I? Uh, why is phosphorin so delayed? Again, it is spin forbidden. It takes time. So that is why it is so delayed. So that means you can understand only after fluorescence is over will phosphorescence happen, right? Good. So this is again a very uh, similar diagram. The only uh, thing different which is shown out here is the vibration relaxation. You can see it is now showing the vibration relaxation to the V is equal to 0 state in that specific electronic state, okay? Right. So, uh, we talked about internal conversion. So, as I said, it is an isoenergetic non radiated transition between two electronic states having same spin multiplicity. In solution, this process is followed by a vibration relaxation to the lowest vibration level or the final electronic state with the excess energy being dissipated to the surrounding medium thermally. Oh, you know, please notice this. In solution, that means essentially in condensed phase. See vibration relaxation will depend upon a lot of things, but obviously one of the immediate things it will depend upon is its interaction with the surrounding solvent. When you go to gas phase again, then you would realize that you do not have any solvent molecules and hence probably in that case you would be able to pick, pick out some vibrational structure which you do not see in the solution phase, okay? especially from the higher vibrational states. And we talked about the characteristic, characteristic time. So the inter-system crossing is a non-variative transition between two isoenergetic vibration levels belonging to electronic states of different spin multiplicities. For example, an excited molecule in the zero vibrational uh, level of the S1 state can move to the isoenergetic vibration level of the T1 triplet state. So this word is again a key word, isoenergetic vibration level. Now crossing between states with different spin multiplicity is forbidden, but still you observe it because there is something known as spin orbit coupling which brings about mixing of the singlet and triplet states. As I wrote that equation down, it makes ISC or inter system crossing feasible. Okay. Now what are the things that enhance or increase spin orbit coupling. There is one thing which is known as heavy atom effect. The heavy atom effect at, as it suggests is being brought out by an atom which is heavy. Okay? That is why the name. So what happens here is inter-system crossing is enhanced by heavy atom effect that describes the effects of heavy atoms on spin forbidden transitions. 
the heavy atom effect can show itself as the internal heavy atom effect where the incorporation of a heavy atom in a molecule will enhance the S0 to T1 absorption due to spin orbit coupling. So that means it goes to uh, goes from S0 to S1 and then it goes to T1. That's why it's S0 to T1 absorption. Okay. Why is it called internal? It is called internal because it is present in the molecule itself. That means it is a uh, part of the molecule. You have not you have not done anything externally to it. It is already a part of the molecule. Okay. And I'll give examples very soon in the next table. So as an example, one iodonaphthalene has a much stronger S0 to T1 absorption than one chloronaphthalene. So both are naphthalene derivatives right one has chlorine the other one has iodine which one is heavier iodine is heavier so where would you see a better t1 population in case of iodonaphthalene right so that's why it's this table is very informative it is referred to as internal heavy atom effect what it says is you have the molecule then the first column is your phi f which is the fluorescence quantum meal i'll come that come to that later i've kind of given you uh, an idea and the next obviously is the phosphorescence quantum meal now see what happens, you take naphthalene, the fluorescence quantum is what 0.55, the phosphorescence quantum is really low 0 0.05 right. Now you go to one chloronaphthalene, in one chloronaphthalene what happens to the, phosphor, uh, the fluorescence quantum yield? It immediately decreases to 0 0.06, According, accordingly the phi p which is the phosphorus is increased, why? Because chlorine now is heavy than, heavier than hydrogen, it has introduced that heavy atom effect and it is enhanced inter-system crossing by spin orbit coupling okay. Now obviously, you guys would be smart, you go to bromo, if you go to bromo naphthalene, what would happen? You see the phi f, it is really low 0 0.002, almost non-existent and then phi p is 0 0.55 and you go to iodonaphthalene, what happens? It is almost not there, there is almost no fluorescence and essentially whatever you see is in terms of a delayed emission which is phosphorescence in this case, okay. So this is your internal heavy atom effect because you see internal being that it is a part of the molecule itself. So th then if one is internal heavy atom effect, then obviously the other one would be external, right. So then the external heavy atom effect is seen when a heavy atom is incorporated in a solvent molecule. That means if you take one chloronaphthalene, it has a much stronger A0 to T1 absorption in iodoethane as compared to ethanol because in iodoethane you have that iodine moiety. So this is external because it is not part of the molecule, but it is a part of the medium which is the solvent. That is why it is external, right. So this is the characteristic time scale for inter-system crossing, okay. Now so this is uh, and uh, you know like the layout you saw for an absorption spectrometer, it, this is the layout for a fluorescence spectrometer, but let us just not go there. Let us uh, do a quick uh, derivation, okay. So let us talk about. fluorescence a little bit, okay. So fluorescence can be observed under two conditions, one is photostationary and the other one is, sorry this is time resolved. So this is your steady state measurement which is equilibrium and the other one is your response as a function of time. So this one is response as a function of time, okay. Now let us first consider the time resolve case, okay. Just for the sake of discussion, let us first consider the time resolve case, okay. So in the time result case, so this is what is happening, right. So what you have is, you have done an excitation that means the sample has absorbed and a set of molecules have gone to the excited state. So that means you have, if the molecule is A, 1 stands for singlet, so you have 1 A star concentration of molecules in S1, right, so I've sent it there. Now this one can come down by generally two types of processes, what are the two types of processes? One is radiative and the other one is non-radiative, right. 
So then I can have this. I will have this where I would be having this one would come to 1a and this would be say I, I would say plus h nu. So this would be kr, k radiative and I write h nu because it is radiative that means it is giving out photons h nu. The other one again it is 1a but this is non radiative. So I write k nr and I am not writing h nu anymore because it is non radiative. So nr stands for non radiative so that means nr. So nr stands for non radiative okay, and r stands for radiative and obviously k are the respective rate constants okay, that goes without saying. Now if you have to try to devise an equation for the rate of its decay. Okay. So, this is how it is done. The way it is done is if you remember your T jump temperature induced uh, laser induced temperature jump rather. So, what happens is I, I said one thing that you have to do the temperature jump very fast boom like this and then the protein slowly relaxes. So, here also you understand you have to do this excitation very fast okay. and then that means it must be much faster than the fluorescence lifetime or the right the time it takes to come down and then you follow its progress as a function of time. Okay. So, what you do is you do a delta function excitation that means this is done with a laser pulse this is done with a laser pulse okay. and you are excitation which is very fast right that is what it means by delta that means okay, so time width is very small it is there the laser pulse is there for a very small amount of time it excites it and then you observe the decay of the excited state right. So, then what will happen is what I can now essentially write is d of a star over d of t should be equal to what should be equal to k r plus k n r 1 a star right. So, let this be 3. Okay. So, now what I can do is this is your kinetics regular kinetics. So, I have d of 1 a star over 1 a star is equal to minus k r plus k n r d of t. Okay. So, then what I can write is 1 a star is equal to after integrating 1 a star 0 that means this is the concentration of molecules you have in the excited state at t is equal to 0 that is the moment you have done the excitation times e to the power minus k r plus k n r t okay. this is equation number 4 right this is just an exponential decay right it is exponential decay because that is how you set it up right. Now, what I can do now is I can rewrite this equation as 1 a star is equal to 1 a star 0 e to the power minus t by tau minus t by tau let this be 5 where tau is equal to 1 by what is tau equal to 1 by k r plus k n r. Remember when we did laser induced uh, temperature jump it was what k 1 plus k minus 1 right here it is k r plus k n r. Okay. So, this tau which is the fluorescent lifetime. So, this is referred to as your fluorescence lifetime it depends upon two things what does it depend upon it depends upon the rate constant of the radial process plus the rate constant of the non radial process. Okay. So, that means when you are looking at a fluorescence when you are looking at the fluorescence you are obviously looking at fluorescence, but you are looking at a process which is dictated by two different processes one is the radiative and the other one is the non radiative okay. that is why I said 
that when you're looking, when this thing comes down, it does not come down just by one process. It comes down by two processes, broadly speaking. And to what extent one process would be more or less than the other would depend upon the type of the molecule, the environment, or a host of other factors. You know, that's what makes fluorescence so interesting. Now, but the problem is, if you're doing a lifetime, right? If you're doing a lifetime, remember, this is what you get, tau. Right? So tau is essentially the time it takes for the molecule to reach 1 by e of its original value. Okay? So that means you have 1 by a star 0 to start with at t is equal to 0. So this tau, so exponential relaxation, right? it tells this tau is the time it takes to reach 1 by e of the original value which was 1 a star 0. You know, that is how your exponential lifetime is def defined. Right? Now, the problem is this guys. Because we know that tau has both kr and knr, if I only make a measurement of tau, I would not be able to get these, right? Because I have one measurement, but I have two variables, which is kr and knr. Now, the same thing happened in laser induced temperature jump. What did we have? We had k1 plus k minus 1, but both of these were coming together, so we could not get that. So, what did we need in that case? For the, temper for the temperature jump, we needed equilibrium. Right, because we had the k equilibrium, so that means we had two equations, two unknowns. What would we do here? Obviously, one is tau. The other one, which I just discussed with you, is the other one is the quantum yield. The quantum yield is the fluorescence quantum yield phi f is given by k r over k r plus k n r. Okay, so this is equation number six. This is referred to as the fluorescence. quantum yield. Okay. This is referred to as the fluorescence quantum yield and once you have this fluorescence quantum yield, we have two equations. One is tau equal to 1 by kr plus knr and phi f is equal to kr over kr plus knr. Right? You can use these two equations to get the two unknowns. Okay. Quantum yield calculation or measurement can be done separately, not an issue people do it on a regular basis. Right? So, essentially then the definition of quantum yield phi of f is equal to the number of photons emitted, the number of photons emitted over the number of photons absorbed. This is the definition of quantum yield. Okay? So essentially, it is a ratio, right? it is a ratio of what? The number of photons which actually come out as light, in this case fluorescence, over the number of photons it originally absorbed. So that means, if you have 100 photons, if it gives out 100 photons in the form of light, your phi f would be what? 1. If it gives out 50 photons, accordingly this phi f would be 0.5, okay? like that. Good. Okay, now, this was your time result. So, time result means you have excited a molecule right? and then you are looking at its progress that means it is decay from the excited state to the ground state as a function of time. right? So, that is why there are like time resolved uh, spectrofluorometers right? which do this job routinely for you. You have excite and then it comes down and you fit it to a certain uh, routine, a certain uh, f uh, form, certain functional form and you extract your parameters okay? tau and all these things. Now, we would not be discussing that at much length. However, I would just you know like to divert your attention to something which we do regularly, at least all of you do regularly possibly on a regular basis is steady state fluorescence. Right? That means, it is like an absorption spectrometer and now you are having a fluorescence spectrometer and you are sticking your sample in to look at what the fluorescence spectrum is. Like you had an absor absorption spectrum for tryptophan, tyrosine and all these things, these should also be having their corresponding fluorescence spectra. So, just uh, give me a little more time and we will be done with this. So, going back to the slides. So, this is a typical, this is a typical uh, you know diagram or layout, optical layout of a fluorescence spectrometer. Now, see what, see how similar it is to absorption right? and what are the things it, ha it has. You have to have a, an 
a source which excites your samples because if the sample does not absorb, it will not go to the excited state, no fluorescence. So you have a, a xenon lamp, right? Now you have a xenon lamp in this case, but in case of absorbance, you did not have a xenon lamp. It's not that you cannot have a xenon lamp. People can have xenon lamps. Okay. Only that in that case you had two lamps, deuterium and tungsten. It's using a more common, right? See after that, what it does is because you have to spread this out, it goes into a compartment which has the excitation monochromator. So again, you disperse your xenon lamp beam into its into its component wavelengths. Okay, I'll show you the xenon lamp spectrum. After that, it comes out. After that, it comes out like this, and you can see out here. So this is the grating. I was telling you this is the part of the monochromator. This is the grating where it gets dispersed. Now you can see out here. So this is your slit. That means there is an opening out here, which allows, which by which you can determine how much of light you allow to pass through to hit the sample. So if you would be doing, if any of you would have done steady state fluorescence, you would see that in the control panel or in the software, you, you determine something known as slit width, whether it's five nanometer or one nanometer or ten nanometer. This is essentially what it is. So you can imagine one thing: if this is your beam of light, having you know the total output coming in, if you open it, you'll be having the maximum intensity. Now, if you slowly close, 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 what will happen? The amount of light that comes through and hits the sample decreases. Now, the reason there is a reason you do it. One of the main reasons is some of the samples are very conducive to photo bleaching. That means if you have too much of sample coming in or too much of light coming in, then that fluorescent molecule can actually get damaged, right? Irreversibly damaged. So you would want to stop that. There are also other things. You know, sometimes what happens is that your detector, whatever your detector is, has a certain response where it is linear to the number of photons that is coming in. If you shine too much light, then that means there would be too much fluorescence and it would cross that linear region, right? So anyway, there are a host of other things. But the bottom line is using the slits, what you can do is you can control the amount of light that is coming in and hitting your sample, right? Then obviously, you have your sample compartment out here, right? This is your sample compartment. Now, which I will not discuss with you, but I will just quickly tell you is, you see there is a beam spreader here. Remember the beam spreader we had in the absorption spectrometer. In this case, what it does is, here one is coming to the sample, a part of this light is going to an absorbance computing cell, so compensating cell, so this one. This is called a reference sample, it goes to a reference photomultiplier tube. And the reason is this, to, very, to be very short, if you are doing a fluorescent experiment, say for 10 hours, that is the time you need. You started with a certain intensity of light before, say at 5 minutes you started with a certain intensity. Now, when you go to 500 minutes, there is no guarantee that the intensity you started with would be exactly the same as the intensity you have after 500 minutes. So, what you would see is if you are doing a time consuming experiment, then because the intensity of the lamp has decayed as a function of time during that uh, time interval, because it is a very long uh, experiment, the fluorescence intensity would get would depend upon the excitation intensity. So, whatever decrease or increase you would be having would not be related to the sample, would, but would actually be an artifact of what? The light that you send through. So, then what you do is this reference photon multiplier, you know what it does? What it does is it always normalizes with respect to your beam that is coming in. So, you take your actual sample and you divide it by the reference photon multiplier intensity. That means that one actually tells you or actually normalizes whatever intensity you have and you get the corrected or true, not true, the corrected fluorescence spectrum. So that's what you should always use if you're doing it for a very lo very long time, okay? Especially if you're doing like a thermal melt for a protein, doing using fluorescence, it takes time. You better do this, okay? That's how you will get the absolute, uh, I mean, uh, best signal or spectra, okay? So after the sample compartment, it comes out. You have reflected out here. Now this sample compartment again goes into an emission monochromator. So the sample is emitting, it emits light over a range of wavelengths, like it absorbs over a range of wavelengths, it emits over a range of wavelengths. So to look at what wavelengths are, you have to disperse the wavelengths, you disperse it with the, res with the help of a grating and after that it comes to the PMT and you record your spectrum. Okay. So this again is just a typical layout of your fluorescence spectrometer. See there is nothing big about it. Yeah, obviously putting these things together, the company does it for us, so we do it. Right? We do not have to worry about this. But if you look at each and every component, 
you would understand that trying to figure out why each and every component is there is not a big deal because you know what why each and every component is there. You know, it's not something we can, can never think of. We know why a monochromatic is. We know why a slit is there. We know now at least we know to a certain extent why the reference photomultiply tube is there. So all these things we can logically think. If you would ever think about this while you're doing an experiment, you would see that experiment for you becomes a lot, lot better because you understand it a lot better now. You have a personal feel about that experiment, and that's why it's so essential for you guys to know what is there inside the box you're using without just treating it as a box. Okay, so that's why I'm taking this paint to show you the optical layout, which is which means it's <coughs> not it's I mean it's nothing out of the ordinary, it's just some very ordinary components you put together, right? Obviously. X parties comes in, in terms of you know manufacturing these things and uh, all right and then you put together in terms of fluorometer. And here this is a fluorometer that people uh, typically use out here. So you can see this is you know this you have taken the top of a fluorometer right this is a this is no longer a block diagram right this is a fluorometer for you okay. Now see what happens if this is the xenon lamp source right you can see this is a lamp out here right then this is a lamp. So this is a monochromator, so it should be A out here. So monochromator comes here. Here is a monochromator out here, right? From the monochromator, you can see th th this uh, brown thing kind of uh, gives you the path. Yellowish brown thing gives you the path of the excitation light. So it's from the lamp, it goes here. There are mirrors. Monochromator comes through. You can see this is the excitation slit, and this is your sample compartment. Can you see this is your sample compartment, right? This is a sample compartment. Okay. Now after the sample compartment, what happens is the sample emits light. So this is your fluorescence, right? This you're looking at. It fluorescence comes out. You can see you have a detector out here, right? You have another monochromator, which is the emission monochromator I showed you out there. Then you have the detector, and it detects the light for you. Okay. So just think about this based on the block diagram. You understood what the is there inside. Okay. There's nothing big. It's just components put together so that you can collect a spectrum. Okay. And finally, this is your xenon arc lamp spectrum. Why did I use that? You can see this is how the spectrum goes. It goes from about this is 250 nanometers on the x-axis, and it goes to pretty high, as you know, 1.1 or 1.2 micron. Now you can understand why, if I would be using a UV visible spectrophotometer, and I would not be taking a xenon lamp. Can you tell me now why? I would rather use a deuterium lamp than a xenon lamp. Why? When I'm doing a UV visible uh, experiment, UV, I would rather try to start from 200, right? Now, at 200, if I'm going to look at an absorbance, your proteins typically have a backbone absorbance at about 222. Okay, let me tell you that. So, if I would be trying to look at a protein absorbance at 222, would I ever get that with a xenon lamp? Why not? Because you look at the intensity of the xenon lamp. What happens? At 250, it's gone. After that, there is no nothing else from the xenon lamp. But if you would use a deuterium lamp, the deuterium lamp you will see would kind of go very high up. So that is why you would use a deuterium lamp rather than a xenon lamp in an absorption spectrophotometer. But it is not that people do not use it. If you want to go to 250 and above, no problem use that xenon lamp. Okay? So, and if uh, some of you have ever done this fluorescence experiment, you would see that there is an instrument calibration that goes on. The instrument, the fluorometer, it calibrates itself according to this region of the xenon lamp. Okay. And this is how a xenon lamp typically looks. Okay. Now, this is a personal request from my side. Do not take the cover off and look at a xenon lamp because that might be the last time that you look at anything. Right? The reason is these are depending upon the power, depending on the wattage, these are very high luminosity, these are very high intensities. Even before you realize, it will damage your eyes. Okay, you would never want to do that, right? And these also have very high voltages going across them. So you can see what happens is that's why it is not just exposed like that. It is housed in a typical housing. What the housing has is, you you forget these condensers, reflect adjustments, and all these things. You look at this, the fan. Like when you guys get heated up, you need a fan to kill yourself down. The same thing happens with the xenon lamp, right? So it is not only we that we that need fans, it is also these instruments that need fans. 
So, zero lamp because it is giving out so much of uh, light that housing typically gets very warm. So, if you would ever look at the fluorometer at a, at a place where you have the zero lamp, you will see there is a fan running all the time. It cools it. Okay? If you do not have that fan running, you would never, if you see that the fan is not running, never put your instrument on because it will damage your instrument. Okay. Well, these are the uh, fun uh, functions of the arc lamp as I just said, I will just complete it. The gas in xenon lamps is under high pressure about 10 atmospheres and explosion is always a danger. The housing protects the user from the lamp and also from its intense optical output. The housing also directs air over the lamp and removes excess heat and ozone. It also removes ozone. Okay. So, again this is a xenon arc lamp and the caution with which we end the class is a xenon lamp that is on should never be observed directly. The extreme brightness will damage the retina and the ultraviolet light can even damage your cornea. Okay. So, you have to be careful. See you just do not go and open up an instrument. At least first you know what I should be doing, what I should not be doing. There are many, you know, each and every instrument comes along with a manual. It is called a manual, right. It tells you how you should be doing things, how you should not be doing things. Instead of how you should be doing things, sometimes take a look at how you should not be doing things, right. That will sometimes help you, really. That is a short thing, there is a small thing, much smaller than what you should be doing, but that is where you should start. And at least that is the first thing you should keep in mind before trying to do what things you should be doing. Okay?